Work is proceeding apace on my lockdown project of a major electrical revamp of the old Defender. Starting initially inside the engine bay in the cab, working on the main electrical system, but now extending all over the vehicle. With so many different work fronts open, one begins to wonder where it will all end, but you have to press on with determination, trusting that it will all come right finally. Having sorted out the vehicle main electrical system, I now turn my attention to the auxiliary system. But the requirements of the two are really quite different. Let me explain. With the main electrical system, we've got circuits which are generally either within the engine bay or just on the other side of the bulkhead in the front of the cab. And the power requirements are quite low. The biggest user is the main cooling fan at about 20 amps. And a good solution to this is to have a wiring hub mounted on the front of the bulkhead and covering all of these circuits. By contrast, the auxiliary system, much more widespread, it goes from the front of the vehicle to the rear, inside and out. And we've also got some significant power users, including the compressor and the inverter. So the approaches to the two are going to be rather different. And I'll show you the thinking behind this in the next section. I'll show here the basic outline of the vehicle, in this case a Defender 110. And you've got the auxiliary battery. In the case of the Defender, it's un under the passenger seat. For most other vehicles, it'd be somewhere inside the engine compartment. I show here the major loads, by which I mean anything drawing more than 10 amps. In fact, of course, some of these could be very much higher, 40, 50 amps. Typically, there might be a compressor in the engine compartment. And in the rear compartment, there may well be an inverter. And some people like to carry a small electric oven. And now we add the minor loads, so inside the cab there may well be some power outlets, charging points, might be a sat phone, might be a CB radio. In the rear probably more power outlets, fridge, outside may well be LED work lights. So let's look at different wiring arrangements. In scheme one, everything is based around the use of a centralised DC hub, and this is located in the rear of the vehicle, which is quite a common choice. Now the DC hub is complicated. It's got MIDI fuses for the larger loads, it's got blade fuses for the minor loads, and it's also got relays. And so you've got the main power supply coming in from the battery going through a mega fuse to the DC hub. I show the outputs in blue to the major loads. And so for example, to the compressor, you've got a long cable going from the rear to the front of the vehicle. I haven't bothered to show the cables to the minor loads because the sketch will become far too complicated. But you will notice that some of these cable runs are going to be quite long as well. And also, for every relay inside here, it means you've also got a signal circuit too. It really is quite complicated. Now, quite apart from the complexity of taking all of the cables back to a central hub, there's then the question of the cable sizes. If, for example, we look at the case of the compressor, the most direct cable route is obviously from the battery straight to the compressor, whereas here we've got to go back to the DC hub and out again to the compressor. And we may, for the sake of argument, have doubled the cable run, although it could be a great deal more. Now, the size of the cable is going to be governed by voltage drop considerations. And if we've doubled the cable run, we're going to have to double the area as well to get the same voltage at the compressor. So we've immediately increased the volume of copper by a factor of four. So what are already large cables are going to become really quite massive. Now in scheme two, we put a MIDI fuse box next to the battery, and this is our first distribution point. And so we feed direct supplies to the major users, to the compressor, to the inverter, to the oven if you have one. But we've also put two or three uh, minor distribution centers around the vehicle. And these contain blade fuses and relays if you need them. And from these you supply all of the minor users which are in the vicinity. So this guy would serve these users and this guy would serve everything in the cab. And if you do this, you both greatly simplify the cabling and you also reduce the size of the largest cables. And this is the scheme which I'm going to go with. 
I'm not going to give you a blow-by-blow -blow account of the electrical installation. It's been covered by others and probably far better than I could do. Now we'll touch on a couple of topics which tend to get glossed over elsewhere. Now from the planning section of this video, you'll see that the main cable runs are in the form of a T, going from left to right and from front to rear of the vehicle. Some quite long cable runs. Now inside the vehicle and the engine compartment, I tend to use this split sleeving, which is very convenient. However, it's no good for cable runs under the vehicle because it gets full of mud and other crud. You're far better off using proper flexible ducting like this. And this comes as part of a system. So for example, you have these junction boxes and you have adaptable boxes and you have these adapters where the ducting needs to pass through a bulkhead or a panel and obviously cable glands too where you need to seal the end of the cable. Now you can get these ducting systems in any ingress protection you want. I went for IP54 which is medium level protection although if it's immersed in water, water will get in at the joints but no problem for me and it doesn't cost too much. I paid a total of £40 for everything needed for this vehicle installation. I went to a local electrical wholesaler, best place to go, the sort of place used by the local electricians. Don't go to a vehicle outfitting specialist because you'll pay a lot more. Cable pulling. For some reason people tend not to talk about it, but it can be a very tricky and very time-consuming job in its own right. And for example, on industrial projects, you hire gangs of cable pullers and it's all they do. They aren't electricians, they pull cable and that's their specialism. Now if you're using flexible ducting like this, the golden rule is to install as much of the cable inside the ducting as you can before you install the ducting inside the vehicle. So for example, if we need to get um, cable through a junction box like this, far easier to do it on the workshop floor when you can really get at it than leave it until this is installed in the vehicle and maybe it's screwed up underneath the floor above your head and it's absolute murder to get at it. Now for thicker cable like this generally you can feed it through from one end although it will try to get caught on the ribs. I find that twisting it, bending it, maybe even um, putting petroleum jelly over the end. I find all of these things help, but basically do whatever works for you. Now thinner cables you can't push from one end because they'll just buckle. And I find that a roll of good thick wire like this, bend the end into a tight hook, you feed this through the duct and you pull it back from the other end. And don't forget to leave good long tails at either end. So easy to underestimate it and there's nothing so infuriating. You pulled a long cable and then when you come to do the terminations you find you're short and you've got to splice on an extra length of cable. So when you've pulled as much cable as you can inside the ducting you then install the ducting in the vehicle. But Sod's law says you're bound to have forgotten one or two cables and you're going to have to install them at the end of the day. So be generous when sizing the ducting and make sure you've got enough room to get those last minute cables installed. Earthing. Now earthing is a big topic in its own right and I don't have time to go into it in any detail. All I will do is I will explain what I did. Now obviously these old defenders use a chassis earth and there seems little point in insisting on earth return cables on the auxiliary system when the main system uses chassis earth. However, I did adopt a hybrid approach, so I used twin core cable to the main power users, in particular the compressor and to the inverter, and I relied on a chassis earth for the minor cables. However, I went to the trouble of inspecting all of the earthing straps, which connect the main components of the vehicle together, the engine, the chassis, the bulkhead and the bodywork. And if I couldn't find an adequate earthing strap, I installed one myself. And I think this is a sensible approach. So after all that, what does the finished product look like?
I think you'll agree it looks bloody fantastic and very professional. However, sorry to disappoint you, that doesn't belong to me and it's got nothing to do with this vehicle. The installation on this vehicle is very much simpler. So starting in the battery box, the first dis distribution point is a MIDI fuse box. I've also got an Alphatronics low voltage cutout to protect the auxiliary battery. Under the vehicle I've got some neat cable runs incorporating junction boxes and adaptable boxes. The compressor and the inverter are both wired directly back to the battery box using twin cord cable. The distribution point in the front of the vehicle, uh, tucked away under the wing, you can hardly see it, but very simple. It's a six-way fuse box and a single relay circuit. And at the rear of the vehicle, well this is what it used to look like, rather untidy, and this is what it looks like now, nicely smartened up. Everything very simple, but don't kid yourself, it's all there. All of the equipment I've currently got is wired in. I've got some spare circuits to cover any future needs. This will certainly cater for any expedition I'm going to be doing. To wind it up, well I would emphasise that although I am a qualified engineer, in terms of auto-electrics, I'm a rank amateur, just self-taught. I don't claim to be an expert. But the one thing I would take away from this, before doing any work, spend a lot of time thinking it through, planning it out, and doing your optimization before you do any wiring. I know that the architect here, which I've chosen for the installation on this vehicle, it's efficient, and I've achieved everything with minimum complexity and minimum amount of wiring. And it's going to serve me for many years to come. I've given myself about four months to shake this vehicle down with its extensive new electrical installation and I aim to be using it for real on a very major trip before the end of the year. Bye for now.